Hello, explorers, and welcome to episode 65 of Unbroken. I'm Alexandra Amor, and I'm here today to talk about the inner critic or that negative voice that can dog us all the time. And this is a subject particularly close to my heart. I feel like it's something that I've wrestled with for a long time and for a long time couldn't see it years ago, you know, it was just it was invisible to me even though it was going on and then gradually I became more and more aware of it but didn't know what to do about it and then I came into this understanding and it kind of I put it off to the side um, but it's come up in my awareness lately and I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, in just a moment I was reading a book recently about um, brain science <laughs> called, I think it's it's either called Mind Magic or Magic Mind by Dr. James Doty. And one of the things he mentioned in there was how his approach to our inner critical voice or his understanding of it was really interesting. And it was about the evolutionary process that we've gone through and how our brains are wired to look for danger and given the you know the society that we live in now and how you know generally safe we are i hope i can say that about you um that our our the part of our brain that's looking out for danger even looks out for it um in our own behavior you know so it's it's able to be critical of us or it believes it's being critical of us in order to serve a purpose in order to keep us safe i probably haven't explained that as well as he did in the book but it got me thinking about the the negative voice the inner critic that so many of us hear um and maybe don't hear that's maybe silent i find it at times just kind of running behind uh whatever else is going on in my mind and I'll talk about in a minute how that doesn't actually matter if we can't specifically hear what it's saying so that's some of the good news so let's jump in and talk about this Um, the reason I wanted to bring it up was that in the past we've talked about how unwanted habits are uh, They are working in our favor, even though they don't, you know, might not look like they are. They are a solution, not a problem. And one of the metaphors I use is that unwanted habits are like the pressure valve or the valve on the top of a pressure cooker. And they, the habit itself lets off a bit of the pressure of what's in the pressure cooker. So this got me thinking about how that inner critic, that negative voice is contributing to the load of what's in the pressure cooker. It's contributing to all the stirred up thinking that's in there and uh, not in a good way. <laughs> it's, it's adding to the pressure that's in the pressure cooker. And so that means that we, you know, in a way we kind of, I think it would help for all of us to look at that kind of negative thinking specifically and learn how to deal with it, learn how to resolve it. And so that's what we're talking about today. I've got three tips for helping you to deal with your inner critic. So I've been experimenting with this, with the tips I'm going to share for the last, I would say, couple of weeks. And it really feels good. I'm really, really enjoying it. It has opened up a space of a good feeling within me. It has take sort of taught me at a new level to not take my thinking so seriously, which I really, really appreciate. And like I say, I just feel this, um, A greater sense of tenderness or compassion, kindness for myself 
since I've been practicing these things. And so, of course, that feels really good. So let's talk about uh, the first tip that I've got for uh, dealing with your inner critic. So the first one is pretty easy and it's something you've probably been looking at a little bit already. And that is to know that the thinking that we have going on in our minds is not the truth with a capital T. Thought, of course, is like energy and it's moving through us all the time and It is not the absolute truth, even when it looks like it is. So let's take an example of you are walking along one day and you trip and fall. And there are so many ways that you can react to that situation. And in the past, one of the ways that I've reacted to any kind of accidental thing that I do, you know, I drop a bottle and it breaks or I trip and fall or I, you know, my, the other day I bonked my hand on a kitchen cabinet uh, knob and it's quite sore. And my inner critic really flares up in situations like that. So it really uh, takes a hold and beats me up and uh, tells me, you know, it can, it does have the opportunity or takes the opportunity at that time to tell me, you know, that I'm stupid or I should have watched more carefully what I was doing. It really does kind of beat me up a little bit in situations like that. And that's been a historical pattern. And what I've found is that as I've been using these three tips that I'm going to talk about, it's actually been fairly easy to break that habit, given what I see now and what I hope to share with you. So we trip and fall. There's a lot of negative talk in our heads and whatever that looks like. And so the first thing we can realize is that all that thinking that's going on, it feels so real and it feels so true. And it's so easy for us to live in in the delusion, the illusion maybe, that everything we think is true and real. And it isn't. So what how our how our thinking reacts to a situation a situation like that when we're when we're being hard on ourselves is probably based on historically the way we've treated ourselves and probably the way that we've heard other people treat us or treat themselves as well growing up and what we can recognize and we're going to dive into this more in a in a future tip is that whatever the the na- the inner critic is saying in that moment there are so many other possibilities for what could be true so to stay with this example if the inner critic if i tripped and fell and the inner critic told me or was beating me up because it was saying I should have been paying more attention. And that's kind of the one note that it's playing on. Just by understanding that that thinking isn't the the truth with a capital T is really helpful. And then what can be more helpful too is seeing that, well, there's all kinds of other things that might be true in that moment as well. Maybe there was a little uh, uneven spot in the sidewalk and that's why I fell. Maybe um, I was getting out of the way, trying to be kind to someone and just kind of caught my foot. Maybe my shoes are too big. You know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons that that particular circumstance could have happened, which simply points out to us that whatever the noise is, the critical negative noise that's going on in our heads that's not the absolute truth with a capital T. And again, I say, yes, it does feel like that. And yes, it really can. It's really so easy for us to be completely wedded to that thinking and to imagine that everything we think is true. But looking in this direction about what other possibilities are available to us is really helpful, especially in this case, 
of dealing with our negative thinking. So that's tip number one. Remember, you know, as often as you can, that the critical, noisy thinking in your head isn't necessarily the truth with a capital T. And then the second tip is that the feeling that you have when that negative or critical thinking is going on is telling you that it's not the truth. So in other words, we don't need to turn this into a situation where we're monitoring our thoughts all the time and trying to catch them all because that actually will take us in the wrong direction. We will add more thought, more pressure into the pressure cooker. So we can let that go. We don't need to um, manage and monitor every thought that's happening. Our design is built so that it lets us know when our thinking is critical. And so the way that we feel when that happens is the um, is the alarm bell or the bar- barometric reading, whatever, however you want to call it. It's the thing that's going to let us know. And sometimes we can skate past that, especially if we're used to a lot of critical thinking and used to the inner critic. And yet what we can do as we gradually begin to notice this happening, the feeling that we're having and the fact that the feeling is alerting us to the fact that we're having some negative thinking, um, it becomes a habit. It, be- it becomes a habit in itself. It's, it becomes automatic almost to notice what's going on. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Well, I'll give you one specific example I experience a lot of urgency when my inner critic is really flared up and I notice that urgency pretty quickly. So I feel that in my body. Um, I feel it in my solar plexus, like there's a tightness there or a clenched feeling. And then I kind of feel it in my, I would say my chest and my shoulders, um, that, I need to, yeah, there's just this impulse inside me. It's almost like it's telling me to run. And what it's telling me is to go faster, to do more. And I, you know, of course, I know that that comes from just a habitual, a habit that I picked up. So as soon as I feel that feeling now, uh, I can, I can be sure that I've got some thinking going on that's not serving me that the inner critic has flared up and those feelings in my body will always tell me the truth about what's going on in my head. So if we're thinking it, we're feeling it. And then when that happens, I can go back to tip number one and think to myself consciously that, oh, there's another experience to be had here. Uh, I had this happen this morning, actually, when I was having a conversation with somebody and I felt that urgent feeling come upon me for no, absolutely no reason. I wasn't in any kind of a time crunch. And so I just did a little bit of silent talking to myself and reminded myself that that feeling was letting me know that my thinking was not the truth, that I was feeling like, or I was thinking that, Uh, I needed to move quickly. I needed to get out of the conversation that I was in and move on. And that wasn't true at all. And through that little inner process, I was able to relax into the conversation. Now, um, you know, it didn't resolve the feelings, all of them immediately, but it was definitely, I was able to step into a much more peaceful place in that moment um, by remembering that my body was alerting me to what was going on in my mind. This brings us to tip number three. And tip number three has to do with the awareness of 
the possibility of a different experience. So in that situation that I just mentioned about the conversation I was having, I simply became aware that there was the possibility to have another experience in this conversation with this person I was talking to. Now, we don't need to get too attached to what that experience is going to be. Um, So, for example, let's go back to the trip and fall example. So you trip and fall, having a lot of negative thinking about it. You notice, first of all, or you remember that your thinking is not the truth with a capital T. That's tip number one. Then tip number two, you, again, you're noticing the feelings in, in your body and how, uh, you know, maybe you're having a physical reaction to the thoughts that you're having, or they just don't feel good. You know, they just make you feel kind of yucky. So that's tip number two. You've noticed that the feeling, the feedback that you're getting is that the thinking that you're having isn't the truth and your body is alerting you to that or your experience is alerting you to that. And then you remember that there could be another possibility, another way to think about this tripping experience. And again, what's important to know is you don't have to know what that alternative is, that the universe is there with its wisdom, with its intelligence, and its creativity, its infinite, infinite creativity. And when we have, when we feel like we're in the grip of a bunch of negative thinking, and this is the reason why this tip is so important, is that it's oh there's always a possibility of another experience to be had and when we know that it softens things and and opens them up a little bit and what i was picturing when i was preparing to do this episode was like a little a tight little ball of string and it's all tangled in knots and when we're aware that there's a possibility for another experience, I just see that tight little ball of string kind of loosen. So you know when you see a ball of wool that's quite loosely wound? That's the difference between the tight little ball of string and the availability of possibilities. So that's tip number three. Being open to the idea that there is always the possibility to have a different experience in any given moment and we like to feel of course and our minds like to feel that we're in control and that we know the outcome of everything and we know how things are going to go but when we can soften a little bit and open up to the idea that there are infinite possibilities available um, that to me anyway it it creates a much better experience of life my grip isn't so tight on it and it it can flow much more easily through me that sounds kind of wishy-washy but I guess I mean it just does it feels like to me like the more open I am to the idea that (laughs) the kind of that I'm not in charge, that life is flowing through me and that it is wise, even when things are going wrong, you know, even when things are not going the way I would like them to go. Uh, Like I had a different conversation this morning that that was difficult and uh, things are not going the way I would like them to go in that situation. And by remembering that there's a greater intelligence involved and that it is flowing through both myself and the other person I was having in the conversation with and that there are as I said earlier infinite possibilities available that could you know come to light um, could occur to someone could change the situation that uh, allows me to let life flow to a greater degree within me and 
just seems to make things honestly so much easier and lessen my suffering about what's going on. And that's the key really, isn't it, for all of us. We don't want to suffer. We want to suffer less. And relying on that universal intelligence, that wisdom that's always available to us is, to me, it seems uh, one way to be able to do that. The final thing I want to wrap up uh, with is reminding you, I rem- I've said this before, but I want to say it again because it's so connected to what we're talking about today. A few episodes back, I think I talked about how Michael Singer, who's a spiritual teacher, talks about how there's really only one practice and that practice is to relax. That's the one thing we can do that will ease our suffering. So that points to exactly what I just said. When we relax, we allow the wisdom of the universe to to step in and to flow much more freely through us. And my friend Tanya Alfersi, who's been on this show a couple of times, she phrases that uh, slightly differently. She refers back to Sydney Banks, who said over and over again to look for a beautiful feeling. And that again, really ties into when we're talking about this uh, inner critic. That inner critic doesn't feel good. And when we notice it, when it gives us those signals in our body, another way to say that we can look for the other possibilities are, that are available is to say, look for a good feeling. There's a beautiful or a good feeling available to us at all times and it that is the thing that will loosen us up that will change the thinking that's going on in our heads so when I have a lot of critical thinking I and I go through these steps remember them I tend to um, imagine myself stepping into Uh, a good feeling a beautiful feeling now that doesn't necessarily mean I can feel it all the time but it does mean that I'm open to the fact that it does exist that there's a good feeling to be had and even if the needle inside me just moves one little notch toward a good feeling you know one little notch away from the yucky feelings that my critical thinking have been giving me, that my body's been giving me that feedback, um, that's a victory to me. And going back, circling back to the brain book I was talking about, I imagine that there is a physical uh, result from doing this. So in other words, we are physical beings, of course, as well as spiritual beings, And we have those physical neural pathways in our brain and they can be like the grooves in a record. So when something happens, you know, when we're triggered, like your spouse doesn't load the dishwasher properly and they never do it the way that you want them to do it, the needle inside ourselves can fall into that groove and just go running with all the usual things that we say about the dishwasher and our spouse and how they never listen and all that kind of stuff. But by practicing the tips that I've talked about today, what's going to happen is new neural pathways are going to be built. So that needle falling into that old groove uh, is going to happen less and less and that path is going to be built somewhere else. So in other words, it's a, it feels like this is both a spiritual practice and a, and it's going to have some physical results in our brain. Now, I'm not a neurosurgeon and I'm not mapping my brain at this time, but I suspect that that will be happening as well as we, you know, practice these three tips. So I hope that's been helpful for you if you're someone with, who struggles with, a lot of negative self-talk, 
uh, the thing we often call the inner critic. It's what I'm realizing is it's not as complicated to change my relationship to that, that kind of noise, that kind of negative thinking as I used to think it was. And there's a, like I said earlier, there's a balance. Well, there's, there's, there's a way to do this without monitoring our thoughts and adding a lot more work to be done. And that's the balance that I would love to see you strike. And so, like I said earlier, this isn't about monitoring your thoughts. It's not about, uh, yeah, managing what you're thinking because your design is perfect and it will always let you know when you're thinking. And when it alerts you to that, uh, with the feelings in your body, um, then you can do something about it. But until then, you don't need to worry about it. And when that happens, it's just very simple knowing that there are other possibilities and stepping toward a better feeling, knowing that, that it's possible to have a better feeling in that moment. I hope that's been helpful and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. And I will talk to you on the next episode. Bye.